Well, um, I guess it's time for us to begin. Let me just first say welcome to everyone tonight. Especially if you are visiting with us, we are we're really glad that you have uh, come to join us on our gospel meeting. Of course, uh, as mentioned, our speaker for our gospel meeting is uh, Brother Matthew Gibson. Brother Gibson is from the uh, Southwest School of Biblical Studies in Austin, Texas. He's an instructor there. And time uh, really flies so fast. We already, as he mentioned yesterday, we are already on, uh, we are halfway through our gospel meeting. Tonight and a couple more sessions that we're going to have tomorrow at 7 p.m. as well as Wednesday night at 7 p.m. will be our final meeting. So you still have opportunity. Those neighbors, family, and friends that you have not invited, you still have an opportunity to invite them before the meeting is over. Before we begin, I do have a few announcements. On our sick list, uh, we want to continue to keep in prayer. Josephine Spears' brother-in-law, Kent, he is not in the ICU. He is currently uh, moved back to his hospital. So please keep him in prayer as well. Also, I want to announce that uh, Bill Rollins is having some severe back pain. So please keep Brother Bill uh, in prayer as well. Also, Phil McIntosh's father's uh, recovered from having a procedure to remove a large kidney stone. He may have another, another procedure uh, performed uh, due to the size of the kidney stone. So I know those things are very painful. So please keep uh, his father in prayer as well. Also, Jim Dukes is wearing a heart monitor. So folks, please keep Brother Dukes in, in prayer. Uh, not only heart monitor, his blood pressure, he just have a lot of medical issues. So keep him in prayer as well. Also, keep uh, the Chafin family in prayer. Uh, Buck uh, Chafin is not doing too well. So just continue to uh, pray for him and uh, understand that you can call him and check up on him. So keep the Chafin family in prayer. Also, Brother Zach, uh, he announced that uh, he had his family, uh, they had a tornado in East Texas, and his family was uh, affected by that. So he had to go back and uh, to Marshall, Texas to, to take his father back. They just now got electricity. Uh, so keep him in prayer as he travels back and forth. He did indicate he will be back tomorrow. So. Keep him and Amanda in prayer as they travel. That's all the uh, announcements that I have, and we're going to go ahead and uh, begin. Uh, the order of service tonight will be our first prayer will be out by our preacher Phil McIntosh. Our song service will be led by Ivan McIntosh, and the closing prayer will be by Brother Dean. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Brother Kingsford. <clears throat> Brother Kingsford, sorry. Okay. Are there any more announcements that I need to mention before we get started? Okay, now let's begin with a prayer. Smile, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, grateful for the opportunity that you have given us to be gathered together. We pray, Father, that we will continue to take advantage of the opportunities in life to step away from various responsibilities of this world, from pressures and stresses, from leisurely activities that we could have decided to engage in, and to take the opportunity, Heavenly Father, to open your word and to study from it. We pray, Father, that all of those who are here tonight will be blessed in their attendance for this evening. We know, Father, that the lesson that we will all hear in a few minutes will be from the Word. We know, Father, that the message that will be given to us is sound and, and trustworthy with the study that Brother Gibson has put into his lesson. We pray, Father, that we will follow along with his message, that we will look into the text that he mentions, Father, that we will ensure for our, our own benefit, edification, 
and salvation, Father, that the, the message that he gives us is in line with the scriptures that you have provided. We pray, Father, also for the other activities of this evening as we gather together in song, we will pay close attention to the things that, that we teach one another as we sing. Uh, we will ensure, Father, that all of the things that we do as we are gathered here this evening are done in a manner that is pleasing in your sight, that is according with your will, and that is authorized by your word. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who are mentioned and those who may have fallen off of our prayer list recently but are still struggling. We pray that you would be with the physical needs of those, Father, who are struggling, who have various illnesses or recovering from surgery or who are awaiting upcoming surgeries. Pray that you would be with those who deal with chronic issues and with nagging pains and aches, Heavenly Father, that cause them distress that have not yet cleared up or been remedied. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who, because of health, are not able to be here with us this evening, that you would grant them a measure of health with the next opportunity, Father, that they will be able to be back with us. We pray for those of our number who are traveling, those of our members, Heavenly Father, who have been out of state, or those, Heavenly Father, who are traveling across the state, that you will keep them safe as they come back with us again. Heavenly Father, we also pray for those who could have been here this evening but have chosen to be elsewhere. We pray, Father, that the message that is given will, will inspire us, Heavenly Father, with motivation and encouragement to, to go and to tell those of our congregation the, the contents of this meeting and to encourage them, Heavenly Father, to attend for the rest of the event and for all the times we have the opportunity, if it is your new will, to gather together in the future. We pray, Father, that hearts will be changed, that intentions will be altered. We pray, Father, that those who consistently have other elements of this world that they allow to stand in between them and a better service to you, that they will be willing to remove those things, Father, that they will be encouraged by the membership here as we seek to reach out to them and to to engage in conversation with them as we challenge them, Heavenly Father, as we challenge each other, that those, Heavenly Father, who are negligent in their attendance, in their work, in their service, Heavenly Father, we pray that they will become more active, they will gain more zeal. And for those of us, Heavenly Father, who are here this evening, help us to, to continue to press in this fight, knowing that allowing ourselves to be caught in the distractions of the world and the influences of the devil to keep us away from the body and away from the study of the word is present and alive, Heavenly Father, in the environment of all of our lives. And we pray that we will continually stay close to your word, stay close to one another, and be engaged, Heavenly Father, in the activities of the church as we strive for unity, for wisdom, for strength, for growth, and progression, Heavenly Father, in our faith and in our maturity. We thank you for your son who has given us the opportunity to come here tonight to be able to hear this word, be filled with hope, to be strengthened and challenged by the message. We thank you for the sacrifice that he has given for us, Father, that we will be motivated by it, knowing that we cannot be perfect, that we cannot live the exact life that he lived, Father, but help us to be challenged by the message, by Brother Gibson, by our continued work with each other, to live to the best of our abilities the way that our Lord lived, to live, Heavenly Father, to the best of our abilities, the way that you have asked us, commanded us, and instructed us to live according to your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who has given us this word. We pray that we look at it with reverence and with respect, that we use it, Heavenly Father, to, to undergird the life that we're living and to back up and inform the decisions that we make. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the sacrifice of your son as he stood between us and we, as he took on our punishment and our guilt, Heavenly Father, on himself, as he was willing to sacrifice that blood for us. We know, Father, that we cannot live in a way that, that earns that blood or the righteousness that that blood allows us to stand before your presence. But we do pray that we would honor it and live in a way, Heavenly Father, that shows that we, that we give honor, glory, and praise to you and to your Son for what has been done for us. We ask that you would forgive us for the sins that we have committed. Help us, Father, as it is our opportunity to go throughout the days if we have more coming, that we would live better lives and make better righteous decisions in the future than we have made in the past. We pray that our eyes and ears will be open to the activities of the evening as we engage in this service. We pray, Father, that we are always willing to, to dig deeper into your word, to learn more from it, to appreciate, Heavenly Father, the, the study of those who have spent time to deliver us this message. We pray that you would be with Brother Gibson as he delivers his message this evening. We pray, Heavenly Father, that he has the opportunity to serve you for his uh, 
as many years, Heavenly Father, in the future as you would allow, both in the preaching school, training students, Heavenly Father, to become better students of the word and to be proclaimers of the truth. And as he continually engages in events like this, such as this meeting, to, to inform us, to instruct us, and to motivate us. We thank you, Father, for the elders that guide us. We pray, Father, for the lives that they are living. We pray that they live in a way that, that models your word for us, Heavenly Father. And we pray that we live in a way that is submissive to, to them and their guidance and their trustworthiness, so long as, Heavenly Father, the decisions are based on your word. We thank you for that guidance. We thank you for the word you've given to guide us and to guide them. We pray, Father, that it is in that word that we, that we live, that we speak, that we think, and we act. We thank you for all the many blessings you have given us, Father. We thank you for this building, for the, the comfortable pews, and for the air conditioning that we have to be able to sit here in comfort this evening, to be able to listen to this word. We pray that you would watch over us and guide us. We pray that you would lead us, Heavenly Father, through this assembly and through all the many times we have the opportunity to gather in the future if it is in your will. All these things, Heavenly Father, we pray through in the name of your son, Jesus. I think 250, 250, all three verses of 250. This is my father's work. This is my father's work. And to my sneers, all the nations and years. The and the mountains Oh, 
Good evening to everyone. It's great to be here, and uh, I am encouraged. How many of us in here are a little tired tonight? Just me? Okay, at least one or two more. <laughs> I don't mind telling you that. Uh, 5.30 came this morning, got ready to go and uh, fix some uh, car issues and got to school. So a lot of times I'm asked, what, what do I teach? And I just usually tell them what I'm doing that quarter. And and today was apologetics and Job and Kings. And so that was a full day and I hopped in the car and uh, the, the brain was telling me, you need to go around the west side of Austin, which it seems counter to getting up here, but because of traffic, it started and hit some traffic. And I thought, man, I hope I make it. I hope I make it. And uh, sure enough, it cleared up and uh, got here. And, and I got here actually a little bit early. And I thought, you know, I probably should eat something. I'm tired and I don't want to pass out on y'all. And so I was looking for a place and uh, right up the road here, there is a Jamaican restaurant. And uh, I've been to Jamaica many times doing missionary work. And if you've ever been there, let me tell you, their food is outstanding. And I wasn't expecting much, but again, that computer brain said, oh, this is an excellent restaurant service and all that went in there. And uh, I was like, wow, I went to a restaurant and I knew what all the terminology was. And I knew exactly what I wanted. And I got to talking to the cashier and um, told him what I was doing and why I was here. And he, uh, he, he said, where are you at? And I said, Colleen Church of Christ. He said, oh, right there. I said, yes, sir. And uh, invited, of course, he was working, but I said, well, we're having a gospel meeting. If you can make it through Wednesday, if not, but I say all that to say this, because Brother Fisher said a while ago, you know, preachers talking about us talking. Imagine that. And I've done a lot of talking today, but I am rejuvenating. When you get some outstanding Jamaican food, I may be going to, I won't go to midnight. I, I got to do this again tomorrow. But what I'm getting at is, you, if you like food like that, outstanding, wonderful people, but for the evangelist, which should be all of us, um, he, he was, well, God's blessings to you. And he asked a few questions and then the line started building up. And so I figured I better step aside. So I say all that to say someone go over there, order some good food and get that guy in this building 
uh, you never know. But uh, anyway, uh, again, I have caught my second wind after that, and I am raring and ready to go. Tonight, we're going to focus on can God really use you? And the Lord's church among sound congregations, as we would call it, generally speaking, there is not a doctrinal issue. In other words, good brethren are going to teach God's plan for salvation. Good brethren are going to teach what is true and acceptable worship for God Almighty. Good brethren are going to teach what church government is all about. They know when the church started and that Jesus died for it and that he is the head of the church. We've got all that down. So tonight we're going to take a journey, maybe more perhaps on the inner battles. The battles that we fight within ourselves, they cause us to be weak maybe one day and strong another day. And by doing that, we're going to look at a fellow in the Bible that every time I read this story, I, I'm just amazed at, number one, the patience of God, but number two, the grace of God. Sometimes the church has shied away from some of those things because of what's going on in the denominational world. And brethren, it ought not to be. Without God's grace, we have no hope of salvation. Not even a smidgen. We don't even make it out the door without God's grace. And so when we look at this man who is about as wicked as they come, at least in the New Testament, and God transforms him to become an apostle unto the Gentiles. You know who I'm talking about already now, don't you? And, and, and change that man's life. I look at it and I say, he can do the same thing for us. And so when I ask that question, can God really use your life, my life? Yes, he can. But we've got to believe that. Because if we believe it, then we will live like we should so that God can use us. And so this is going to be our attention here this evening. You see, Saul is a very unlikely candidate and use uh, or to be used by God for his glory and his honor. This man was feared. This man was hated by Christians. Can I say that? Hate in Christian? They did not like this man. And we're going to see that here uh, in just a minute. This is a man who did everything in his power to stop Christianity. Brethren, Saul would bust through those doors this evening, and he would stop this gospel meeting in its tracks. If he could do so, that's how much he detested Christianity. Ironically, though, he believed in God. He believed in God. It's interesting how people reach those conclusions. Just the fact that, oh, we are speaking of him this evening tells us that something went on in Paul's life. And God used him in such a manner that his work is still being spoken of today. Dare I say, brethren, we are still reaping the fruit of what this man accomplished many, many, many years ago. When we look at Paul, we may be tempted to think that maybe he was some kind of super saint. I don't know if you've ever thought that way, especially new in Christianity and, and studying. I was like, man, this guy's an anomaly. This is, a, this is an odd guy. There, there's no way people can be like this. He's one of those extra special people. Not really, though. When you look at it and you study Paul's life, you realize he's human being. If you were to pull Paul, he would bleed just like you and I would bleed. And God created him in that fashion as he did us. And so while we may think there's no possible way, let us know that God will use us if we will make ourselves available. You probably detected that in yesterday's lessons as well, because really, brethren, in the church, in the strength of the church, the soundness of the church, this is something we're slipping, making ourselves available to God Almighty. One thing that doesn't help is the land in which we live. The abundance of, the, of things that we have, I'm not fussing as it because we're born and raised here, but letting those things get in the way of being all that we can for God Almighty. And so some ask the question, perhaps in your own spiritual walk, if you've been a Christian for a while, I know you have. Can God really use my life? I'm waiting, God. We're not going to get a telephone call. We're not going to get a text. We're not going to get an email from God that says, Matt, here's what I want you to do tomorrow. 
We already have it right here in the word of God, as Brother Phil offered up in the prayer, studying his word and learning his will for us. This evening, brethren, God can use your life. And so we take full advantage of it while we have breath within us. So Acts chapter 9 is where we will be, where we will be, say that five times fast, where we will begin this evening. And we're going to look at the past condition, your past, my past condition, the present, the personal, and then we will conclude with the private. And so as we get started here in Acts chapter 9, ask yourself this question and truthfully answer it. Where are you at in your walk with God Almighty? Preacher, you're preaching to the choir. Can I say that in the Lord's church? You're preaching to people that are already here on a Monday night when it's 110. Yeah, we were looking for AC, weren't we? When it's 110 degrees outside, brethren, we are what we might say the cream of the crop. Now, that's not to toot our horn or to walk about in pridefulness, but to remind us that we are the foundation. We are the earthen vessels. We are the workers for God Almighty. And I would hate to think that we stand before God and have missed something. Let me ask you, have you ever thought of this? And if you've traveled around, you've seen different ways of doing things in the Lord's church. I mentioned Jamaica earlier. That's a totally different place when it comes to worship services. What do I mean by that? If you don't go at least two or three hours in worship service, you've sold them something short. They're not happy. Uh, if you don't preach for an hour, hour and a half, they don't feel like they got their money's worth. Now, I'm figuratively speaking there. I'm not saying that to shame us. I'm saying that's what they are accustomed to. And I say all that to say this. Being raised in the church, not myself, but a, a long time, if you have or if you're not raised... I do not want to be like the Israelites who generation after generation got a little further and a little farther and a little farther away from God. How would you like to be that fourth or fifth generation and think that what mama and daddy and grandpa are teaching you is God's will only to find out that that was not God's will. That's why it's always important to have a reading of the law, a reading of the word, reading the Bible for ourselves, not to question and doubt mama or, or grandpa, but to assure us that generation after generation is staying close to God Almighty. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. Paul's past condition, according to his own words, his own testimony, he was guilty of doing everything in his power to put Christianity to death. As a matter of fact, hold your finger there and turn over to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22 and uh, look in verse 4 with me. It says, And I persecuted this way unto the dead, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. One more look at Acts chapter 26 and verse 10. Acts 26 and verse 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. This evening, brethren, this Saul would not be our friend. As a matter of fact, many of us might turn and run if we knew he was coming to town or go into hiding. If your family was at stake, what would you do with your family knowing that this man was coming to town to put people into prison and see to their death? As a matter of fact, still holding your, I promise we're going to be back in Acts 9, but hold your place. Turn over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Well, uh, I was just going to mention it, but let's read that together because here it gives us a little something about uh, Paul's life again. Now, remember, the book of Timothy is written to the young Timothy by the Apostle Paul, an older man, a fatherly figure, writing to a young son he had taken under his wing. And look what he tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. He says, hold fast a form of sound. Oh, excuse me. Let's try 1 Timothy, and then we'll be where I want us to be. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. 
He says, who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Look what he says, of whom I am chief. You want to talk about someone living in the past. We, we painted a picture, a, a picture of gloom and what this man did to Christians. And at one point, one day, he called on the Lord and was immersed to have his sins washed away. You think Paul ever thought about what he did in the past to Christians? Do you think he struggled with that? You better believe he did. Look what he just said. I am chief. That tells me he, he, he had bouts of, of, I mentioned, depression, anxiety. Getting past the past of his life and moving on to the glory of God. He is proof in the inspired word of God that it can be done. Now, I'm emphasizing this, brethren, because maybe a little bit myself, definitely in speaking with others, there are brethren who cannot get out of their past. And it makes them less effective for the glory of God. Paul was a murderer. Paul rebelled against Jesus. Religiously, he was a man to be envied, but internally, he was wicked or as wicked as any other man on the face of the earth. I put him right up there with Ahab in the Old Testament. This is not a fellow I want to be around. I don't want to be a friend. Oh, if I need to teach him the gospel, I will. This is not the person that you sign up to be uh, uh, buddies with in, in, in the bunkhouse, military or camp or whatever. You're going to stay away from this guy. In Acts chapter 7, verse 58, we learn there that Paul guards the clothes of the soldiers. He's holding them so some people can't steal them or, or take them or whatever it might be, while they murder Stephen. By guarding the clothes of those guys, it tells you that Paul approved of what they were doing to our brother Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Paul was a wicked man, but it proved no obstacle. For the grace and saving power of God, as he brings out in 1 Timothy that we just read, that God, through his grace, spared him that he might change his life. And when Paul obeyed the gospel, he was forever changed. How about you? Think back of when you obeyed the gospel. It was your spiritual birthday, no doubt. And is your life different today than it was when you obeyed the gospel? Well, we would have to truthfully say yes, but you know where I'm going with that, right? Has your life truthfully changed for the better? That you are a greater blessing and glory to God Almighty than the day that you obeyed the gospel. I'm not saying you didn't hit a pothole. I'm not saying you had to climb over a mountain or go through a valley. But where, be honest, is your spiritual walk before God Almighty this evening? Hear the scriptures. Your past is no obstacle to the future work that God has in store. Regardless of what we've done in the past, when we take the right steps, it matters no longer what those things were. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was in conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3 and 7, Jesus referenced it as a new birth, a new beginning. Only if our minds could wipe that out as well. God certainly has. Brother, there are three records of your past deeds in this world today. And when you break it down this way, hopefully if anyone here is struggling with that, it will help us to get past that. Number one, there is a record that you carry in your own mind. Maybe you beat yourself up. You know what I mean by that? You just can't seem to get it out of your head, something that you have done. Number two, there is a record carried by all those who knew you before. And they remember maybe when you were that wild Tasmanian devil, or you weren't a Christian, or, or things that you might have said or done. But then the third, and brethren, this, this is the one that I don't want to say scary, but this is the one we need to give full attention to. And this third one of record of the past is carried by Satan. And you know what that old devil will do? He will throw it in our pathway every single opportunity he gets to try and cause us to stumble. And to take us away from God Almighty. 
And so, while we may remember the past, while friends and families may remember the past, and while Satan surely remembers the past, God in heaven has forgotten my past. God in heaven has forgotten your past. It is no longer to our record. It's no longer held accountable to us when we repent of our sins. And so our past serves as no obstacle before the eyes of God and us serving him now and in the future. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's a wonderful thing that our God looks at us that way. Throughout the Bible, God uses people in spite of their weaknesses and many times after some of their greatest failures. I do this a lot in my preaching because I need to be reminded personally and hope it's not selfish. Hey, these are real folks and look what they have done. Peter preached his greatest message, Acts chapter 2. And he did his greatest work for the Lord after he denied the Lord three times in one night. Moses was a murderer and God used him. Think about, I was thinking about this with Samson. I used Moses last time when I was here last year. Samson, he sinned against God, yet he slew more Philistines in the end of his life than he did in his entire ministry. For God Almighty. Jacob a deceiver. Yet he is transformed. And greatly to be used of the Lord. God can take those who have failed in the past. And use them for his glory today. And into the future. We've got to believe that brethren. God sometimes has more confidence in us. Than we do ourselves. Let us align with God. And how he sees us. So that we may be used for his glory. Number two, Acts chapter 9 and verse 2, your present circumstances. And he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if any found of, his, of this way or the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You know, in war, sometimes it is set up unless you're a soldier on the front lines, but you do not mess with the women and children in war. And if you do that, you're looked at as even even more evil than someone who is just soldier against soldier. Isn't it interesting how the Bible specifically tells us there that he was after both the men and the women, bringing them bound unto Jerusalem. It did not matter to Paul what gender you were. If you were a Christian, you were marked. He was after you. And so here Paul is on his way. Matter of fact, what is Paul doing here? Is he on vacation? No, Paul's on his way to Damascus to arrest more Christians and take them to their deaths. He's filled with hatred. Again, he wants to destroy Christianity or anything connected with Jesus. And in spite of all this, we know where this is going, do we not? God is going to use him. You know, uh, it's become more commonplace now. I think the church is accepting it more, but hear me out what I mean by that. When I say accepting, I'm talking about the sin of homosexuality. I'm not speaking of accepting homosexuality, but I mean in teaching the gospel. When this was first surfacing in the United States, I ran into it, maybe because I was also younger. Oh, we stay away from them. They're, they're, they're gross, nasty people, and uh, we, we're not going to do it. And what I mean by that, perhaps not even evangelizing it. Okay, uh, I see some of y'all shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about. There's no surprises here. I would be to God that it does not matter who the person is, we would be willing to evangelize it. But I, wa I wanted to share some with you. I, I prefaced all that because uh, when I was preaching in Corpus, we had a man that came to the congregation. As soon as he set foot in the building, you knew that he was different. He had on, I don't even know what you, overall shorts. They were overalls, but they stopped like shorts. They didn't go down to the ankle. I, I don't know what y'all call those. Tell me after services. And all his nails were colored. And he had on earrings and uh, some kind of army boot thing. And he was coming to services and he kept coming just as friendly as could be. And as I got to talking to him more, I, I learned. You know, I, I had I had my concerns that, well, I think this guy is a homosexual. Then he told me, yeah, that's what he was. He also had AIDS. We let a homosexual with AIDS in the church building? Brother, he is just as much in need of that blood that we spoke of yesterday as every other sinner on this earth. 
All right, so things are going. He's coming. We're studying. He obeys the gospel. To God be the glory. And it was a team effort. My elders come to me and they say, Matt, this young man needs a different wardrobe. You take him to the store and you get him a new wardrobe. Now he's going to ride in my automobile. This man has a disease. This man has lived a wicked lifestyle, but I'm not going to tell my elders no. This was many, many, many years ago, by the way. And I was all for evangelizing, but now I got to go and put it into action other than just teaching and putting them in the water. And so we take off to the store and uh, we start uh, picking out clothes for him. And I mean all of them, shoes, socks, underwear, shorts, pants, dress clothes, you name it. And he goes, and I'm on one aisle looking for something for him. And uh, some people say I shouldn't tell this story. I believe it sh I should. But and he's in, he's getting him some undergarments, some underwear, and he finds some, and he comes, Matt, 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 oh look at these, these are so cute, these are. Just, I'm just going, oh, 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 get me out of Walmart, get me out of Walmart. That was trying for me. I'm not going to lie to you. Not the fact that he was, a, but being associated, being in that store, he was my brother in Christ now. And he was making those changes. He moved away, and the last I heard, he was faithful. But I don't even know if he's still alive. He was a very, very sick man at that time. I tell you all that to say that in his present situation, he was willing to obey God in totality. And God changed that man's life. And there happened to be some character along the way by the name of Gibson that needed some humbling and some learning experience in that situation. It was tough for me. I never hesitated, not, not at least in action, but I did mentally a lot. I struggled with it a, 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 a lot. And, and my point being, may I remind us that God can do the same thing in any human being's life. And so when I said this more this evening, we're at evening, right? <laughs> Last time I checked. When I said this evening about us being gathered here this evening, but I really want us to dig deep because evaluating ourselves, making sure that we are walking in the light, we will be able to be that salt and light to the brethren that are not here, that have chosen, or to those in the community, wherever we find our place in life. We will be an example of our Lord and Savior. If we do not let the past or if we do not let the present circumstances affect us. Again, the Bible is filled with these kinds of stories. I want to bring up Moses again. Brethren, do you know how old Moses was when God said it's time to go to work? Moses was 80 years old. Now, I know they lived a little bit longer back then, but 80 years old when God says it's time to go. Now, Moses had other problems as well. He's not very eloquent. At least that's what he tells God in Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 10. In Exodus 4 verse 1, he says, God, I'm scared. I'm scared. He was totally opposed to the Lord's plan for his life. Yet, despite all this baggage, Despite him being an older man, despite him being a, having a speech impediment, despite him being scared to death, God takes this man and uses him for his glory. He never did force Moses, but God had a way of presenting things that Moses could not turn down. The demonic in Mark chapter 5 was a man that was feared by everyone, but God was able to take this man that was causing much, much trouble in the land. And he was able to use him as a witness for the glory of God. Now, brother, maybe some of these are extreme cases. What about us that are living normal lives? If you can define what normal is, let me know. But living our lives, of course, God can use us. Another one, 2 Kings chapter 7. What an interesting story there. So the people are literally starving to death. The enemy has encompassed the city, and the way they're going to gain the victory is by starving the people out. No food can come in or, or, or go out. But God confuses the enemy army, and they all take off running. You know, there's four lepers in town, and they were looked at as a social outcast. They had to keep their distance. They had to holler, unclean, unclean, when a clean person came. It was a rough way of living. 
And they are so hungry that they said, you know what? Let us go to the enemy camp. Maybe at least we can find some food. That's desperation right there. And they take off there in 2 Kings chapter 7 to the enemy camp. And when they get there, guess what? There's no enemies. They're all gone with all the food and the spoils that are there. And man, they start taking it and they start taking it for themselves and they come to their senses. The immediate was focused on satisfying their hunger and taking what they could. And they said, wait a minute, our people back in town are stark. God uses four lepers in a very desperate situation to save an entire city. Amazing what we read in the Bible. What I am attempting to say is that our present circumstances, brethren, do not catch the Lord by surprise. The only ones that they surprise, not even our friends and our family, is ourselves when we convince ourselves and hinder ourselves for the glory of God. God knows everything there is to know about you. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. He knows where you are. Look at Job. Look at Jonah. That man tried to run away. He will use your life if you will yield it to his glory. I'm not done with the lesson, but I'm going to give us the answer and the secret to that right now. Turn your Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, to be exact. And let's read verses 1 and 2 together. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul, whom we're studying about this evening, is writing this. And he says, I beseech, I plead with you, I beg with you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, what? Or present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He is pleading with his brethren that they take action. And that's the way it is with God. God's going to use us, but we have to yield completely to his will. And that's what Paul is saying. Present yourselves and look at verse 2. Be not fashioned or conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the will of God. Isn't that amazing there? The secret lies in putting into practice what we know the Bible to be teaching us. And brethren, God can use us. Do not sell yourself short because of your past or because of your presence. present. Number three. In Acts chapter 9, we see that our personal characteristics are no obstacle. So we looked at 1 and 2. We know that God performs a miracle here as Paul is on the road to Damascus. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. When Paul says, who art thou, Lord, initially in verse 5, that was a term of respect, not necessarily a term of acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God. It was a term of respect. But how do we know that? Look what he says. I am Jesus whom thou persecute. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? It got his attention. And so... As we fast forward then, and we get to verse 8, Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. He was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. Now, verse 10, I know the focus is on Paul, but I can't leave this section without considering Hananias for just a second. Look at verse 10. There was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. Take Ananias out and put your name in. There was a certain disciple of Damascus named Matthew Gibson. All right, I got my name in there. You put your name in there. And to him said the Lord, and he said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Now. Remember, we put our name, verse 13, then Ananias, then Matt answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. What is that telling us? This man is scared. He is literally, Lord, <laughs> do you know who you're asking me to go and speak to here? You want me to go talk to the man that's putting families in prison, seeing to their death? 
I don't know that I signed up for this when I became a child of God. What does Revelation 2.10 teaches? Be thou faithful unto death. We would say it this way today. Be thou faithful even if it means your death. And thou shalt receive the crown of life. Ananias is scared. But thankfully Ananias is able to overcome his obstacle. And the world is forever changed. Because of that good decision that he made. Look what we have in the New Testament regarding the Apostle Paul. And so Paul is definitely feared by the followers of Jesus, as we have uh, just read. His conversion was seen by many, by many Christians, that is, to see something more than a trap that he was setting up for them. In other words, the people of that time, many of them believed that he's just uh, becoming a Christian so he can get more of us. He can find out where we're meeting, where our church buildings are, where we're, where we're meeting for worship. When he went to Jerusalem, as a matter of fact, to meet the apostles, Barnabas had to go with him. That's another one. I know we've got to stay focused on Paul Gibson, but Barnabas in this story as well goes to this wicked man, and he takes him, and he introduces him uh, to the leaders. God is able to overcome this hurt, this obstacle. And still uses Paul in great fashion. If we took time to look at Paul's life, you will find a man with many personal characteristics that seem unfavorable with his success. Think about it. If we get in the business of comparing ourselves with others, brethren, we are in for a rough ride. Because you see, when we compare ourselves to others, they are sinners as well. And we are all in need of the sweet grace of God Almighty. And by the way, we tend to compare ourselves to those that are worse than us. Unless we're just trying to be cool by being bad. That doesn't make sense. Ask a young person. They can explain it. But what am I getting at here? Many of us have personal characteristics, perhaps causing us to think that we cannot adequately or faithfully be used of God Almighty. I'm here to say this evening that God excels. And taking the weak and foolish things of this world and using them in a great way. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27. Turning again to the pages of the Bible. We've already mentioned Moses. God takes this old man. With the, and if you're at 80 or above, no offense. But 80 is a long time. Y'all stop looking at each other. <laughs> they take this elderly man with a speech impediment. And he uses them as the arm of God. Esther is another favorite of mine. He takes a young Jewish girl and he saves hundreds, if not thousands of people from a slaughter. One girl. One girl. God uses a beggar named Lazarus to preach a daily sermon to a rich man. That rich man did not yield the lesson of Lazarus, did he? All of a sudden, he got real religious after he died. You remember, not only did he ask for a drop of water in Luke 16, he begged for a miracle that his brothers might be saved. By the way, do you know what the response was of Jesus? Jesus, in that discourse he's given us, says that his brothers have Moses and the prophets. That's our way of saying they have the Bible. Let them hear the Bible. And so we learn these things in God's word. God uses 12 unknown men from all walks of life, from a tax collector to a fisherman, and on the list goes to turn the world right side up, to set it on fire. Let me ask you, have you ever risen from your slumber, from your sleep, ready to set the world on fire today for the glory of God? They're not going to come to me. I'm going to go to them. And wherever we may be, we're going to strike up a conversation. I'm going to make a social visit, and I'm going to turn it into a spiritual conversation. God can use me. And this is the power of God's word that's going to change people's lives. But you know what, brother? God's not going to cause this Bible to float in the air and go through the walls and, and go and bop someone in the head and get their attention to study in the Bible. God has entrusted us with this weapon, with this medicine, with this power to get it into the hearts of our neighbors and our community. How are we doing? Past, present, 
physical characteristics, personal characteristics, whatever it may be, what might be hindering us from serving God Almighty? I want to use one more. And who other than the Son of God himself? Our Lord had strikes against him almost from the get-go. They tried to kill him before he was even two years old. All the people assumed that he was an illegitimate child of a Roman soldier. John chapter 8, verse 41. Do you know that was in the Bible? That's what they thought of Jesus. Others saw him as being no more than the son of Mary and Joseph. Still, some thought there was no way God could use someone from Nazareth. That's a bunch of wicked, degenerate dummies over there. Others question the fact that he came from Galilee. Some even said Jesus was nothing more than the tool of Satan. Mark chapter 3 and verse 22. Even with these marks against him, who can deny that the Lord used his life perhaps more than any other person that has ever walked this earth in the time that he was here? I mean, sorry, you ever wrestle with that? You ever look back and say, you know what? I should have invested my time a lot better for the glory of God. Brethren, that's that living in the past again. And you're letting it affect the present. Whatever it was, put it behind you. And say, today is the day that I change, that I step forward. Thankfully, we still live in a country, for the most part, where we're not going to be stabbed with a sword or something else because we ask someone if they would like a Bible study. How would you like to be in China? The brethren have to hide in houses to even worship God. I don't want to be there. But moving on, regardless of where you are, or excuse me, regardless of who you are, where you came from, no matter what problem or problems you may think or you do have in your life, what personality quirks that you have, what your level of education is, wise or otherwise, whatever your level of acceptance is. Did I get them all? If not, hopefully I got the, the point across here. God can and will use you if you will make yourself available to his work. He is looking for those that are willing to serve. Now let us look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as we wrap it up here uh, this evening. Mind you, now when I say that to the students, they know that I'm not done yet, but we're on the back side than we are the front side. But one more point here, and I appreciate so much your attention this Monday evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. So we've looked at the past condition, the present circumstances, the personal characteristics. Now, the private concerns. Private concerns. What do I mean by that? Well, let's read together. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I did it again. I'm so sorry, brother. I knew that one, right? Chapter 12, not chapter 11, verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Did y'all hear that? My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. God had given Paul special revelations. He had some thorn in the flesh that's been debated and discussed for, for centuries. But Paul, uh, basically, Paul says, God, please take this from me. And God says, no, I'm leaving it there to keep you humble. I'm leaving it there so you're not exalted above what you think you should or, 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 or think you are. In fact, Paul says that his weakness guarantees him greater strength. Let that soak in for just a moment. His weakness guarantees greater strength. I've seen people abandon God because they broke a fingernail. 
Brother, that's someone that wasn't committed. Don't let that be said of us. Two of the kindest, sweetest ladies I have ever met in the church. And I'm not saying that other ladies are not kind and sweet, but when I explain to you or tell you the story, you'll understand what I'm getting at. Both of them wheelchair bound. One of the sisters, I, I do not know the exact term. Old terminology would be something like elephantitis, where the skin just swells and swells and swells. If you ever had your skin swell, if you've ever had a sore like a boil or something, you know what I'm talking about. Imagine your whole body that way, that your skin expands to the point that it just bursts open and liquid pours out. I remember this sister coming to services and she would have she would have baby diapers wrapped around her leg to contain the liquid. Now that I'm probably emphasizing that too much, but as a young man, I remember and that late, I know she heard. I know she heard. She told me she heard. She always had a smile on her face and she always wanted to know how I was doing. You know, I couldn't complain to this sister. I ran freely that day, went to school, probably had played soccer, soccer practice, ran around with my friends, and it took her the whole day to get ready to come to services. And there wasn't a person that was going to stop her from coming. And when she came, it wasn't, whoa, is me. She was excited to see her. That had a lasting impression. Another one was a preacher's wife. She's no longer with us in lots and lots of pain, wheelchair bound, Always a smile on her face. Always concerned about other people. And I have asked myself, and I still do from time to time, like driving to Colleen, what did these two sisters possess that I can get a hold of? I need some of that. Because I can get fussy sometimes. I get a little hungry or a little tired. Maybe my sugars drop a little bit. I, I sometimes. Well, my wife's going to be here tomorrow. Don't ask her. I'm just telling you it can happen, okay? She might give you more detail. But what I'm getting at is, you know what? Those, we all have our weak moments, and I'm sure those sisters did too. But my point is this, brother. Look at Paul. Paul, it bothered him so much, he prayed to the Lord three times, the scripture tells us. And he says, you know what? I've learned that my weakness guarantees me greater strength. Verse 10. Like Paul, you may look at yourself as being weak, maybe unable, a thorn in the side. It's too much and hinders you for Christ. Brethren, God does not need us to be strong and able to stand on our own two feet. God needs us to be weak and totally dependent. There's the catch. Totally dependent on his power. As we look at the Bible, we can find God using what we would call weak and turn them into something great. Hannah wants a child so bad as she turns to the Lord in desperation. Please, God. Give me a son. So much desperation that she wants a son. She says, I will dedicate him to him. Dedicate my son to you. That's turning the boy over to the temple to be used in temple services. But she was willing to take that in order that she might be granted a child. To be barren or without child is tough in any generation. And especially as we read that in the Bible. I think of Daniel. Have you ever thought about those boys? They are taken into captivity. They can't be above 20. In their teens, whatever they are, a teenage boy, when God gives him the strength to stand up against the king and says, we will not bow down to Babylon or the false gods of Babylon. How could a young, I've always, I've always wanted to meet Daniel's parents. You ever thought, what kind of training did that boy get to have that kind of courage and strength? And he did not bow down Mary was a young teenage girl when God asked her to carry the Messiah and her virgin womb. What reproach she must have lived under. Thankfully, her husband, her soon-to-be husband, Joseph, he could have made a public affair of it, but what does the Bible say? He was going to put her away in a private manner. But think of everything that, you know, when, you, when you're expecting, you get further along, your mamas know you don't, you don't really hide that pregnancy too well, do you? Right? How far along? When's the baby? Is it a boy? Is it a girl? Everyone's excited. Well, not when it's not according to God's prescribed plan. We'll get into that on Wednesday night a little bit. But the point being here is she was strong in God. Now, brother, think about this. 
She affected the lives of millions and millions of people. For when she gave birth, she gave birth to our Lord and Savior. Now, the emphasis is on him. I get that. But let's not dismiss what this young lady went through for our Lord to arrive here on earth. Some of us fight depression. Others battle loneliness. Some fight against feelings of inferiority. Some keep it their wickedness of days gone by constantly before their eyes. They, they, they won't let up. Some of us feel inadequate. Brethren, whatever weakness it is that you carry this evening, it can only be an obstacle if you let it be. That's the great wisdom of the evening. It is only an obstacle if you allow it to be an obstacle. So next time we want to give an excuse to one of the elders or the preacher or one another, think about that being an obstacle that you need to overcome and let that weakness become your strength for the glory of God. It is not a problem with the Lord. Can God use your life? You better believe that he can and he is willing and he is ready and it has, and we have to be able to turn over. I want to close with just a few questions real quick. Number one, are you really safe? By the way, if you answer no to any of these questions, come up here in just a minute and let us help you. Are you really saved? I didn't say, are you baptized? I did not ask if you were a member of the Colleen Church or if you're visiting wherever church is that you're attending. I asked, are you really saved? You think of all the verses in the New Testament that says, watch out, Matt. Keep walking in the light. You can lose your salvation if you become unfaithful to God Almighty. Did you know there's more verses about losing our salvation than there is being immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins? Now, it's all important, but sometimes when we put it in a number comparison like that, you go, whoa. Brother, we need to be sure of our salvation. Number two, are you fully surrendered? Is your absolute all on the altar of God? Or are you holding anything back? Think of a vice that you might have. Maybe no one else knows about that vice, but you do. You're holding back, my friend. You're holding back. God cannot use you. You've got to yield everything over to him. Number three, are you available for him to use? This may be the most significant one for us. That is, is your life so cluttered, so busy with everything, there is nowhere for God to get in any use of you. We do not have to wait until we are retired, brethren, to begin doing the Lord's work. We just have to make it a priority and start doing God's work. Finally, are you willing to be used of the Lord? Again, God's not going to force it on us. Now, he may make you wish that you had, but he's not going to force it on us. If you answered no to any of these questions, then do not let embarrassment be an obstacle. Do not let the lack of courage be an obstacle. Do not allow ignorance to be an obstacle. Let us know so we can help. We'll study the Bible together. We'll grow together. We'll sharpen one another so that we can all be Christians and go hand in hand. Isn't that beautiful? To be with our God one day in heaven. May we challenge ourselves to examine our hearts and do what needs to be done for his glory. And if you're lacking in that and we can help you, please come while we stand and while we sing. Have thy affections been held to the cross? Is thy heart with his heart? Hast thou count all things for Jesus the Lord? Is thy heart high with God? Is thy heart high with God? Washing the crimson tongue. Thanks and holy. Humble and lowly, rising the signs of God. For all thy house under Jesus' control, there's a God. Does he know that thou hide in thy soul? There's a heart high in God. Is our heart high with God? 
washing the crimson blood. Of all and holy, by the Son of God. Please stay standing for the closing song and for the prayer of God. 165. Oh, thou prophet, thou labor All three verses of 165. Oh, thou fountain, Henry, thou seen. To my heart, unto me, sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing. Call for souls to love and his praise. Teach me to adore thee. May I sing Wow, the whole time, story fills my heart. Joy and love. Here I raise my hand and peace in the heart and the heart and I hope that I will dancer safely to the world. Jesus, I love me when I sing in the church. My to rescue me from danger, and to precious blood. Oh, to raise our great let thy goodness, like a pleasure, by my whole dream heart to thee. Never wander from thee, never be like a Here's my heart, take a seal, seal it for the That's free. Dear Lord, we thank you this evening. We thank you for giving us and our family the chance to live once again. And we thank you for taking us to work and bringing us together to come and listen to your word. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor in Jesus' name. Father, this evening we have gathered here we did not stay in our various home to be Facebooking or Instagramming. But Lord, we have come here this evening because we know that our hope is not built in the work that we do. Neither is our hope built on the retirement account or the savings account that we have or the mansion that we live in. But you alone is our hope built on. So this evening we have gathered here and we ask that may you bless us and have favor on our soul. Father, this evening, your word says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, that if two of us on earth agreed on anything that we shall ask, that it will be done by our Father which is in heaven. Father, this evening we are more than two, and together we ask for strength for the elderly. 
We ask for healing for everyone that is sick. We ask for knowledge for every student. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, if Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises in Acts 16, 25, for all their chains and shackles got broken, this evening we pray that by the time this gospel meeting ends this week, that every, gener every generational cancer that exists in our family be broken. That we pray that every sickness, disease, illness that has put us in chains be broken. That every soul or heart that is depressed or is bitter be healed. That every account that has never seen money, we start to receive money in Jesus' name. Lord, we have come here. We have listened to your word. We pray that may you have mercy on us so that we will not just be the hearer of your word, but the doer and ambassador to your word. Lord, as we are about to leave, we pray that may you have mercy on us and you continue to bless us today, tomorrow, and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.